expected variants. We've seen variants. Um, this particular one has more mutations than any of the other variants we've seen before. So the question really is, is this a variant that was circulating in Africa before it was detected and described from Botswana and South Africa? Or is this a variant that was in at an individual for a while acquiring its mutations and then coming out into the general population? Both of these are very feasible. And once we have no sequence data, we'll have a better understanding of what's going on. Well, the early data are based on sequences. And we have in JSAID about 125 sequences, though I believe in the next week or so, we should have a few hundred more. In addition to that, the fact that this particular virus has what is called an S gene dropout, it actually means that we don't, may not need sequencing to detect this virus. We might be able to detect it with, this, with some kinds of PCR. That will allow us to get very rapid epidemiological information. And once we have that, we have a sense of spread. The early data from Gauteng province in South Africa does look worrying because the numbers have gone up quite rapidly. So in that sense, you know, the sequence data shows that it may be more transmissible. And the early data seems to indicate that it is something that is spreading quite rapidly. don't know that yet. If you have a virus that is spreading easily, you know, if it was spreading in a vaccinated population, we would have an answer quicker about immune escape. But in South Africa, only about a quarter of the population has been vaccinated. So therefore, it may be spreading very well in mostly unvaccinated people. We know from reports from Israel, from other places, that this has been detected in people who have received two, even three doses of mRNA vaccines. But we shouldn't worry about infection in the vaccinated so much. We should worry about disease in the vaccinated. Are these people symptomatic or not? And at the moment, we don't have data on that. We do have data from South Africa again, showing that hospitalizations have gone up a bit in the last few weeks for SARS-CoV-2. And that's a worrying indicator. But on the other hand, we've had reports that where uh, clinical features are available for people who have tested positive, then in general, it has been asymptomatic or mild. So I think in terms of the severity of disease, in terms of the immune escape, we still have a lot to learn. So it can outcompete, so variants outcompete each other, but that's because they have an advantage in transmission. So, for example, the variant that was most able to escape the immune response was the beta variant. But the beta variant, we saw occasional cases here and there, but it didn't spread across the world the way the delta variant did. Alpha started spreading and was interrupted by delta. So now will Omicron interrupt delta? We'll just have to wait and see. One, wherever you have parties and crowding, even in vaccinated populations, if there is someone who is infected, infections can happen. We generally should not worry too much about infections. Obviously, we want to prevent them because we don't want the infection traveling and then affecting someone who has risk factors. You know, at a freshers party, people with risk factors are going to be low. 
But if these freshers live at home with their grandparents and others, even though everyone may be vaccinated, older individuals are at higher risk. So we do want to stop transmission as much as possible. But we also have to understand that infections will happen when infected people come in contact with others. And we should expect that. And or mostly from public health and health systems points of view, you don't worry except for the transmission traveling to vulnerable populations. Because young people who get infected will make a good immune response in response to the infection. They are already protected most likely from severe disease because of the vaccination. So for them, there is very little to worry about. But when it comes to sequencing data and trying to understand clusters, it's very important to have the data back quickly, one month after an event has occurred is not the point, you know, it's, it then becomes an academic exercise. It's not going to help you with control of a new variant if it had entered the population. So lots of important points you brought up, disease in the young, the kind of events where transmission happens, the potential risks of that, as well as the pace of sequencing. Frankly, I think the time for travel bans is over. It does not make sense. Travel bans is going to delay a proportion of new viruses coming in. But we have to remember that these viruses spread in asymptomatic individuals. Okay, it's very likely that these viruses are already in much more than the 12 countries that are on the top of everybody's lists. It may be here in India, but as you mentioned, our sequencing is so slow that we don't know even if it is here now. Hopefully now the sequencing will be faster and we'll have an answer to that but we cannot permanently exclude any variant in the world from traveling unless you shut the world down completely again. And that we don't need to do. In general, vaccines protect reasonably well against severe disease. Yes, we need to learn more about this particular variant. We need to keep following up with people figuring out clinical picture, how well are the vaccines working, which vaccines are working well, where is the virus. All of this is important, but we can do this without a travel ban. I think the most important thing is being able to track people, right? If you want to know the extent to which you have a particular variant in the country and you think it might be important, then make sure that you know where people have come from and where people are going. Now you can do your PCRs at entry, you can have your quarantine rules, all of that is very good. As you, we discussed earlier, the sequencing turnaround time must be faster. Oh, we must have this you can sequence today and have a result tomorrow. So if this is going to be sequencing directed essentially at the travel population, there is absolutely no reason why anybody who tests PCR positive today does not have a sequence by tomorrow. And as I mentioned, you can also do S-gene dropout PCRs in which case you could have a result within hours. Okay, and in public health response, if your goal is to stop transmission of a variant, then timeliness becomes very important. If your goal is to stop overwhelming of your health systems, then track what is happening in terms of clinical information 
from cases everywhere in the world and prepare your health systems for that impact. Okay, so actions taken are very dependent on the goal that you have for public health, for policy. So testing has to have a purpose and you have to know what you're going to do with the results of the tests when you scale them up. Once again, if the goal is to stop Omicron from coming in, one, I think it may already be here, but if in the short term, we want to rapidly ramp up testing in the hope of stopping it coming in, then you need a testing protocol with at least two tests for every incoming travel. Now you can do that before they travel and then you can do that five days after they travel. You can do a test when they come in or as the government has recommended, another test one week after they have come in. Either approach is all right. All approaches will miss some cases. Right, but you you have to be realistic about what is feasible. It will eliminate a few cases, but uh, you know, in the long term, what is it that you're trying to avert? My focus would be much much more on now on developing a strategy for testing that is aimed at detecting clusters, which means you start with symptomatic individuals, okay? Um, if we are to test asymptomatic individuals, where do we want to test them? I think that is very important for us to define. And for that, Using rapid tests can be an approach that can be used if you, for example, want to protect critical functions as much as possible, then you might want to frequently test people with rapid tests so that you reduce the number of infections. It's important to understand that testing is going to result in reduction not in complete avoidance. Personally, I think with the kind of zero positivity rates we have and with the kinds of uh, vaccination rates we have for single dose coverage, there are very few places where this kind of testing would be required. And to me, that testing should be aimed at protecting vulnerable populations. So, for example, if you have an old age home or you have a ward where immunocompromised people are looked after, those are the places where you want to make sure that infection does not enter. Since we know nothing about Omicron, isn't it a little too early to talk about boosters? I definitely think that second doses are required and we should be focusing all our efforts on getting those second doses into the elderly and people with comorbidities. When we start boosters, again, boosters should be aimed at the elderly and those with comorbidities. If there is one thing that we have learned about SARS-CoV-2, the risk factor is age and comorbidities. We must protect those people first, not be chasing, this is the number we vaccinated when the bulk of the people that you're vaccinating are healthy young people. 